Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is Mike Bryan, and I am the Youth Engagement Manager for CyberUp. And today we have the honor of uh, hosting Chris Elbring, an application security engineer from an undisclosed organization. Um, he is going to be going over the OWASP Top 10, uh, which is very important in cybersecurity to understand. So I hope you enjoy his presentation. During the presentation, if you have questions or comments, please put them in the chat. And at the end of Chris's presentation, then I will go into the chat and I'll read those out and we will address those at that time. Um, and now I'm gonna hand it over to Chris. Uh, Chris, take it away. All right, thank you, Mike. Um, here, give me one moment. I need to make sure I'm sharing the right screen. Yes. Don't worry. Uh, yeah, I will just share that entire screen. Screen two. All right. Can you guys uh, see my screen? All good. Okay, fantastic. All right. So I'm here to talk about the OWASP top 10. First, I'll go through a um, couple things, uh, just some like house cleaning, regular stuff. So who am I? My name is Chris Elbring. Uh, I'm an application security engineer. That means I work on uh, securing applications throughout the uh, development of them. So uh, I particularly do web and mobile. Um, and I work at uh, a financial technology company. We aren't allowed to say where we work when we give public presentations like this just for uh, security purposes, I guess. So um, I'm a CTF player. I play what are called capture the flags. Um, I, information security and hacking is more than just like a job for me. It's a hobby. It's something I find fun. It's something I find really interesting, you know? Um, and I think it can be like, CTFs are a great way to like practice hacking, I think. And it's like just a, a fun time. Uh, and I'm an OWASP member, right? I'm a member of the local OWASP chapter and um, yeah, I'm gonna get into what OWASP is now. So OWASP, it stands for the Open Web Application Security Project. Uh, it's a nonprofit uh, founded to improve security of software, originally just for web applications. Now uh, they have like a mobile top 10 and they have a bunch of stuff about testing uh, mobile applications. Like they have a bunch of standards and like there are a bunch of acronyms and stuff. Uh, any acronym I use in this presentation, I will try to uh, define afterwards because there's a lot of acronyms in uh, InfoSec, I guess. So uh, what do they do? They provide tools and resources for developers and uh, security professionals. So uh, one famous one is OWASP Zap. It's um, a proxy so you can like, um, mess with internet traffic in between the browser and the server for hacking purposes. Uh, they're, they are a uh, community, they provide the community and networking uh, like opportunities. So there are local chapters, there's a Slack channel. Um, the St. Louis chapter is actually about to make a Discord. Um, so if you come to our meetings, you can join the Discord server. Uh, and then education and training. So they provide training courses online, in person, there are conferences. Right, some of these are more geared towards developers, some of them are more geared towards uh, security professionals. Um, and yeah, you should join our local chapter, meetup.com slash OWASP-STL. It's a great place to network. It's a great place to learn more about cybersecurity. Um, uh, the next meeting is April 29th at 7 p.m. And we're gonna be talking about uh, bug bounty. So yes, very exciting. Um, so what is the OWASP top 10? So this is a list of the top 10 most critical risks for web applications. Uh, criticality means incidents, so how often it happens, and severity, so like how damaging it could be to an organization. These are just like averaged out from a bunch of data. So uh, different OWASP members can submit uh, findings from like third party assessments of pen tests, internal testing of their applications, uh, bug bounty programs, like anytime they find a vulnerability in a web application they can add it to a spreadsheet and then send it to OWASP and OWASP will use that in developing the next top 10. So uh, the current version is the 2017 version. Uh, they're currently compiling the 2020 version. So when that comes out, that will be the new standard, but that is not 
uh, finished yet. So um, here is the OWASP top 10 as of 2017. So the most uh, critical, the number one is injection. So this can be anything from SQL injection, uh, no SQL inject injection, LDAP injection, command injection. So basically this is anytime the web application is sending uh, untrusted data to an interpreter. And I'm gonna go through these all again more in depth on later slides. Uh, broken authentication. So um, authentication, if it's just like implemented wrong or something, uh, it allows an attacker to like impersonate another user or something like that. So that could be the actual like, login mechanism or attacking session tokens or something like that. Um, uh, sensitive data exposure is just not protecting what should be classified data. So this could be caching it, not encrypting it, you know, sending it in clear text, saving it somewhere in clear text, writing it to disk. Like anytime you just like, aren't protecting data that uh, should be protected. Um, uh, XML external entity. So I mean, this one, it's just about, uh, so some XML processors allow you to evaluate uh, what are called external entity references. So what this can do is it can lead to uh, like basically just like file exposure on whatever server it's on. Uh, but depending on some circumstances, it could even be like uh, remote code execution on the server. So uh, and then broken access control. So this is about authorization not being properly enforced. Uh, so this can be like IDOR, like looking at another person's data just by like changing the key um, that's associated with the user, um, viewing things that you should be allowed to use, escalating privileges to like administrative privileges. Uh, number six is uh, security misconfiguration. So this is like the most commonly seen issue. Uh, like it's very common. So I mean, this can be just like insecure default settings, um, you know, like error messages that are too verbose, like that didn't get turned off, um, just like not enforcing critical control, like security controls at like every level, right? Because like there are things you have to do to configure systems to behave securely and um, it's very easy not to. So uh, number seven is cross-site scripting. So this is anytime untrusted data from a user is written into the DOM, like into the web page, like. DOM is document object model. It's a way to talk about uh, like the HTML on a web page, uh, but uh, it's not super important. So it allows an attacker to like execute JavaScript in um, another person's browser. So yes, yeah, so it's a very it can be a very critical flaw. Um, and security serialization. So um, serialization is how different. Um, it's how like an object from a program is uh, converted into data that can be sent across a network or sent, you know, sent basically to another application and then it can be unpacked back into the same object. But some, uh, some programming languages have insecure serialization formats or serialization formats that take extra care because upon deserialization, if there's a class in there that like executes code upon instantiation or something or something like that, right, it will just, execute this code. So if an attacker can control the object that's being deserialized, uh, that can lead to remote code execution. This also is one that's very uh, serious if it does exist, but it's also usually really hard to exploit. Um, number nine is using components with known vulnerabilities. So most code that's in an application isn't written by the people that are actually developing that application. Like usually there's just like hundreds of dependencies, maybe thousands of dependencies, you know, so if you don't keep all of these uh, up to date, then uh, there might be a known vulnerability in them, which then an attacker could leverage to take down your application. Also, this includes the systems upon which like your application is running, right? If you're using like an outdated operating system or like unpatched, you know, like web server, like Nginx or something. Uh, so yes, it's important to keep those updated. Uh, and number 10 is insufficient logging and monitoring. Right, so this allows attackers to like just further their attack on systems to maintain persistence and like remain uh, undetected. And like the longer a breach goes on, the more costly it is. And uh, breaches usually go on for like a pretty long time, which we'll get into in uh, that section. So uh, let's talk about injection. So a common example uh, with 
SQL injection. So um, how it happens usually is untrusted data is being sent to an interpreter without being sanitized. So the interpreter in this case is uh, the database. Um, it could also be the operating okay. system for a command injection or um, okay. just anytime you're sending like untrusted user data or data that includes untrusted user data to something that, the, that is then interpreting it and executing it in some way or returning some value from it, like there could be an injection vulnerability. So uh, like direct use is just sending user data directly into uh, into the interpreter. Yeah. Uh, and concatenation is just concatenating user data with some other string or some other object and then sending that into the interpreter. So uh, there should be a trust boundary between uh, the client. So everything uh, like here and here, there's a trust boundary. So you cannot trust this uh, data. So you shouldn't yeah. just send it directly to an interpreter without first like checking it. So uh, yeah, and yeah. using non-parameterized calls, and we'll get into what uh, parameterization means uh, in a further slide, but it's a way to prevent this from happening. So uh, code example, right? Here we have uh, in uh, PHP, just setting up like a, like a SQL uh, server connection. And then here we're getting this get variable, like right here, it's Apple. And then uh, we're putting it, we're just appending this. So this is like concatenation. So basically we're just putting this directly into the SQL query, right? So then that creates a query, by, which is like select item name, uh, item description from items where item name like Apple. So this will select anything that begins with the word Apple from the database, right? Um, so you can, but since it's just putting it directly in here, uh, without modifying it all, or without checking that it's safe, and it's just like concatenating these strings together, right? You can basically write whatever you want here, and then as long as this output is valid SQL, it will inject it. So, um, example, that would be sending a request like this. This is all just URL encoding, um, which corresponds to what the different uh, like things here are. But if you send something like this, right, you end up with a SQL query where we now have a union select on the end and we're selecting a username and password from users where username is like this, you know? So that means now we're dumping all the usernames and passwords along with just like that record or like all the things called Apple, you know? And this query was never meant to be able to dump like users and password passwords from the database, but it can because we can just like append any SQL we want to this, basically. So that is what uh, SQL injection looks like a lot of times. Uh, so yes, um, and we can get into prevention. So um, what we want to do, right, is they have what are called like prepared statements or uh, it's like parameterization. Um, so usually what you want to do is let whatever um, is generating the query, like have some library or something that does this. And that's like all it does, sanitize the query for you, right? You can also filter, right? So I could try to filter for like the word union or filter for special characters and do all these like filters and stuff, but filters can be bypassed. Like you want, especially one that you're implementing yourself. Like the most important thing is to use a, uh, is to use a proven implementation to um, filter and escape dangerous characters or just do a parameterized query. So this will generate a query that will always be safe. This will never let you, uh, this will never let you inject like um, other SQL into the query and yeah, when you are filtering, if you are filtering, like if that is the best uh, option that you have, you're gonna wanna use like positive filtering or whitelisting. So that means you say all the characters are, that are allowed, period, instead of just saying which characters are disallowed. 
because it's very easy to miss one. So like if you say here, all the characters that are allowed are just A, B, C, D, E, F, G, you know, the whole alphabet, like uh, capital lowercase, you know, that will work. Like that will be, um, that would be fine. Like that's prob there's probably not a way to uh, get around that. But if you just try to filter some characters, because there are a lot of characters that might do the same thing, all sorts of stuff. I mean, I think I need to not digress as much. I got to get through these slides. But yes, so you're going to want to use positive filtering. So whitelisting versus blacklisting. Um, all right, broken authentication. So uh, authentication and session management. So this is uh, verifying your identity, right? So we'll talk about this a little bit later, but so there's authentication and then authorization. They sound kind of similar, but authentication is proving that you are who you say you are. And then authorization is the privileges that are afforded to a user, like whose identity is known. So uh, here we can go through, uh, these are some of the things that uh, like make an application vulnerable to, um, broken authentication. So a big one is like not preventing like brute force attacks. So uh, like a lack of rate limiting. So allowing people to just like stuff credentials into your application and generate millions of queries. Uh, so there, there are some ways to prevent that. Um, another one is having a weak password policy. So not enforcing strong, long passwords, not making users rotate passwords. I mean, not every website needs to do that. Like it depends on the criticality of the website, you know, but, um, like allowing people to reuse a password that they've already used, not enforcing like a second factor of authentication, uh, things like that. So an insecure password storage. So um, storing passwords as plain text or storing them as encrypted. So uh, you want to store passwords as hashed. Encryption is reversible. Hashing is not reversible. So that's one thing to remember. You wanna hash passwords. I mean, you can still encrypt the database or whatever that they're in, but it's important also that passwords are hashed and not just encrypted. Um, also it could be using like a weak uh, hashing algorithm. So you wanna make sure that you're using a strong uh, hashing algorithm. And then, uh, so session management issues. So you want session tokens to, uh, not be enumerable. You don't want people to be able to guess the session token of another user or like somehow generate it. Like you want it to be random. Uh, you don't want to leak session tokens anywhere. So a session token is once you've authenticated with the website, right? It sends your browser a token, which you'll usually use as uh, a cookie. And then this is what then proves your identity. So you don't have to type your username and password in on every single uh, like action you want to do on the website, you know? So and that token has to be protected, right? You don't want to leak that. So you don't want that to be cached anywhere. You don't want that to be saved anywhere. Um, and you want it to time out after a certain amount of time, right? And once a user logs out, it should invalidate that session. You know, it shouldn't, that session token shouldn't remain active. Um, so, yes. Um, so, yeah, prevention. So, uh, for the brute force and automation prevention, we want to do IP rate limiting, uh, maybe proof of work, CAPTCHA. So uh, we want to limit the number of times that a single IP can make a uh, make a sensitive query, like a login query, um, like a login request. And then, uh, but this can be bypassed with something called like like a rotational proxy, where you just switch your IP address every single time you send a request. So you also want to implement something like proof of work which uh so it makes each request solve a challenge basically like the browser has to solve like a mathematical equation basically uh that consumes some small amount of like computational resources so the a regular user isn't going to notice it but at scale so if like you're trying to brute force passwords it becomes too computationally expensive uh because it just like if it, it's if it just costs like a quarter of a second each time you know like that just not being able to send um you know millions of requests like very quickly it quickly becomes like very hard for an attacker to like brute force passwords um and then captcha that's just a system to uh make sure that someone is human versus a robot making the request so this is i know you've seen it where you have to click everything that is a 
like street light or something, you know, those sorts of things. Those are captures. It used to always be you just type in like whatever the words are that the computer can't read, but you can. Um, so yes, that is um, what catch is. You want to enforce uh, a strong password policy. So that means enforcing length, complexity, having like a rotation policy if necessary. Uh, length is for real, like the most important thing. Like if I could offer you guys any advice, it would just be like use a very long password because it increases the entropy more than just increasing like complexity because it's like changing like the number of like the exponent versus just like the base number that you're like like exponentiating. So yeah, and we want to hash passwords. Uh, we want to store them securely. So uh, bcrypt, script, SHA-2, these are all uh, secure, like standard uh, password hashing algorithms. You don't want to use MD5, you don't want to use SHA-1. Um, and you want to salt the password. So salt's a random string that's appended to each password. Um, because every time you encrypt just a single word with, uh, or every time you hash a single word with the specific hashing algorithm, right, you're going to get the same thing. That's how it can check the password and know that it's correct. But what that can allow is like a pre-computated like hash attack. So like a rainbow table attack where you've uh, computed like hashes already for just a huge list of passwords and then you can just compare the hashes. So what assault does is it appends um, just a string to each password. So then when you hash it, you get uh, something else that can't be, um, that can't be uh, just like pre-computed because each thing will have a unique random hash appended to the front of it. Um, so uh, before um, hashing it, so it'll have like a unique random string appended to it and then hash it, which will just change the hash entirely. Um, so then we should, you should have a secure session token lifestyle. So you should have new random high entropy session, session IDs. So you should have very long session IDs with like that are hard to um, guess. You know, um, you don't ever want them to be in the URL. You don't ever want them to be returned that way. Uh, you need them to be securely stored and validated after logout. Um, Anytime, like the person's idle for some amount of time, and then even sometimes you want to enforce like an absolute timeout. So even if the person is there, they will have to reauthenticate um, eventually. And so for all these things, right, you're going to want to use proven implementations again. Like you're very rarely going to be rolling your own crypto. Like you don't want to use your own hashing algorithm, your own encryption algorithm that you came up with, right? Like using a proven implementation is uh, just the way to go usually. So. Uh, the next one is um, sensitive data exposure. So the level of protection on data depends on what the data is. So if it's like personally identifiable, personally identifiable information, credit card numbers, passwords, uh, stuff like that, probably you'll want some level of data protection on. And then also if you have like regulatory requirements. So regulatory requirements can be like the GDPR, which is the general data protection regulation. It's a European privacy law. Like if you've gotten those like cookie things, it's like our site uses cookies. Like that's a something that has to do with the GDPR. So users have to um, like accept that they're going to get uh, cookies from that website. Um, CCPA is like the California equivalent to the GDPR. Um, and I mean, the US federal government will probably follow suit eventually, um, but we do not yet have a federal like data protection law. Um, so PCI uh, is the payment card industry data security standard. So this isn't a government regulation. This is a regulation from all the major credit card companies that have like this thing and they have uh, this regulatory body that they've created. And if you want to like accept a Visa and MasterCard or whatever on your website or something, you'll have to be um, PCI compliant. So um, there's like a lot of these, it's just like a huge checklist of like things you have to do and how you're protecting data, how you're storing credit card numbers, all that sort of stuff. Um, and then HIPAA, which is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Uh, and this has um, a lot about um, protecting health data. So um, how sensitive data exposure happens, sending things in clear text. So using stuff like HTTP, not HTTPS and FTP instead of SFTP or FTPS. Um, 
So external traffic is especially dangerous. Anything in between like your server and um, and a client, like a web browser, you definitely want to make sure that that's encrypted. Um, but anything like even internal traffic in between like load balancers and web servers or web servers and like backend systems like databases or anything like that you always want to make sure that every connection is <clears throat> encrypted um using weak cryptography so that can be using like a weak broken um like deprecated cryptographic algorithm or using like a weak key um and then just having keys that are uh reused somewhere not um rotating keys not having proper key management like having keys that are leaked somewhere um all of those can uh cause the data exposure um and then caching sensitive data um so anytime right your browser gets uh gets like information from a website it like it wants to cache it and the website specifically has to tell it not to cache it if it includes sensitive data because when it's cached right it's written to disk and it's written uh because that that allows the website to then load it faster because it already has the data you know but if um if it's written to disk right it's not protected at all anymore if anyone gains access to that computer again right they will be able to read that sensitive information. Also, it can be cached at like a lot of layers, right? Like, so caching can happen at um, the browser level. It can happen at uh, like the CDN level, like um, so, like the content delivery network. It can happen at like load balancer, like anywhere the like the anywhere the whole system is trying to make loading the website faster. It might be trying to cache information. So you want to make sure at all these places that you're not caching. Um, sensitive uh, user information. So uh, the first thing is we want to classify our information, know what information we have, know uh, what regulations like correspond to it and standards to which need to be protected. Uh, we want to encrypt data at rest. So that's whenever it's just like on disk or, um, you know, not being used. We want to encrypt data in transit. So um, going to want to use like TLS wherever we can. So HTTPS, you know, uh, we want to choose like the cipher suite that um, negotiates that connection. We want the server to choose that and always choose like the most strict that's available. You know, we want to enforce like strong uh, encryption um, and we want to have proper key management. Uh, we want to have our private keys protected. We want to rotate them. We want to make sure that uh, they're strong and cannot be enumerated in any way. Uh, yes, we want to enforce encryption. So like there are things where people can like downgrade HTTPS to HTTP, but we want to say like, hey, you can only communicate with our website with uh, HTTPS, you know, so we can send um, uh, security header called HSTS, which is strict transport security. Um, and then just like be like, hey, you can only use our website with HTTPS, you know. Um, and then disallow caching of sensitive data. So we want to um, disable caching so you can send a header that's like no cache basically to the browser and say, do not cache this response. And then we can also disable caching at like the CDN level, load balancer level, anywhere we're trying to make the page faster, right? We want to make sure that we're not uh, caching data there, not caching sensitive data. We want to cache. We want to cache everything else because we do want our site to be performant. But we have to make sure that we are not uh, caching sensitive data. So um, XML external entity. Uh, so this is whenever an application accepts XML directly. Um, so to like an API or something. Some APIs communicate via XML or an XML upload. Um, so uploading any sort of um either just a dot xml file or a lot of files are like just based on xml like word documents and stuff are just a big xml file for real um so yeah inserting uh untrusted data into any xml document like if there's a document generation um that's happening and then it has to be parsed by an xml processor so um this can be leveraged to read from the file system. Um, we can have remote code execution. 
Uh, remote code execution has like some funny, like it, it has to have a very strict set of circumstances. Basically, uh, PHP, it has to be probably running on PHP and PHP has to have the expect module loaded. So that allows you to call um, basically, uh, that allows you to call um, binaries from like, like you're requesting a file or like you're requesting a uh, like HTTP page or something like that. It, it lets you call files, it lets you call binaries like executables from PHP like that. So um, that's pretty rare usually, but you never know. Um, and then you can sometimes do a denial of service. So that'd be like reading from a file that doesn't return like slash dev slash random or something or um, uh, server side request forgery. So this is um, when you are uh, making a request from a server. So once we're on the web server, right? Once we're behind the firewall, we now have access if we can make HTTP requests from that server or any request from that server, we now have access to everything else that's behind the firewall and can communicate directly with uh, this, um, with the web server upon which we're generating the, um, the request. So that's what uh, server-side request forgery is. All right. I'll give uh, an example. So let's say we have an API that takes a request like this. So it just is taking a request that just has a username. The username is Foo and it's just returning hello Foo. So we probably aren't going to have uh, an API that's just returning like exactly what's sent to it. But you can imagine this maybe like writing to a database or um, just storing this somewhere that can be viewed later um, or something like that. Like anytime, like let's say you're creating an account, you create your name in the account, right? Like you're gonna be able to see that later, right? So um, usually it won't be this direct, like it might have some like out of band aspect to how you actually see um, the data, but um, maybe not, maybe it will just return it directly. Um, so, what we can do is we can send it a request like this. And this, this is basically um, what should be disallowed by the XML processor. So this entity, uh, XXE, so this is the name of it. And then we're calling system and we're just reading everything from Etsy password and putting that uh, now like variable, I guess you'd call it, that whatever value was found from this operation, which is just reading a file from the file system. So then the API will return hello and then the contents of the Etsy password file. So it would return like hello, root, whatever, Chris, whatever, and just return all that. And that's just like an example. So then you can read any file that um, the user whose context uh, um, web server is running in has access to. So yes. So X, uh, XXC prevention, right? We're gonna wanna use uh, less, complex, less complex data formats like JSON. Uh, and we wanna um, avoid de or avoid serialization of like sensitive data. Uh, we, the biggest thing, just like use safe XML processors and libraries, like most, um, most like modern XML processors, like you have to turn on external entities, like it's off by default, you know? which is the way it should be, but um, yeah. And we wanna make sure that um, any XML processor used in the application or under, or like on the operating system is um, not allowing for this. And then um, again, whitelisting filtering. So um, we wanna filter, sanitize um, and use positive whitelisting. So, or use positive filtering or like whitelisting, right? So just only allow certain things, like don't allow, um, don't say, oh, you just can't write the word entity or something because people might find a way um, around that. So you want to use positive filtering. All right, uh, broken access control. So this is authorization not being properly enforced. So uh, again, author authentication is validating user identity and then authorization is what the user is allowed to do. Uh, so bypassing access control checks. So that can be just by like, just lying about who you are and seeing if it lets you do it basically, or um, if something's just enforced client side, right? If it's not backed up by a server side check, like if it's just checking in the browser, if the user is who they say they are before like making the request, like that can always be bypassed. Like 
everything coming from the client should be untrusted. Um, so, um, yeah, so IDOR attacks where you can just change, like, let's say you have, you're on some website and it makes like a request and in the request it has just like a user ID and it has some like ID assigned to you. If you just like change that user ID, you know, and then it returns another person's information, that's um, IDOR, which is an insecure direct object reference. Uh, but yes, so that's what that is. And then privilege escalation, that's elevation of privilege. So, um, right. <clears throat> That's like usually just like acting as an administrator or someone with more privileges than your um, account should have. Um, <clears throat> how to prevent it, right? So we want to deny by default. Um, things should have to get access to things, right? Like again, this is like the positive like whitelisting thing, right? Like everything, access to everything should be off by default. And then only if people match a certain thing, should they get access to it? You shouldn't have everything's open. And then only if it matches this, then they're denied access to it, right? Denial should be the default. Um, <clears throat> then we wanna enforce access control server side. So anywhere where you're checking who a user is um, and like if they have the right to do something that should be enforced on the server. You can also enforce it on the client just for like a better user experience. So like it just like displays correctly and stuff, but uh, it's important to enforce it on the server as well. Um, we want to implement uh, access control mechanisms once, right, and reuse them throughout the entire application, right? You don't want to have a disparate like things, like a lot of things, right? You want to have central implementations of all your security things, and then just all different parts of your application can call into that. And then that can act as your source of truth or authorization, um, because it's much easier to update that one time. If you do find some like vulnerability with it, it's much easier to keep track of it. Right. If you have just have a centralized uh, implementation and you want to remember the principle of least privilege, right? Like users should have the least amount of privilege they need to do their job or do whatever their role on your site is um and nothing more because like they might be able to combine privileges in some way that you weren't expecting to then uh get some unexpected uh outcome so then um we have security misconfiguration so this is the most commonly seen issue and this uh yeah i mean i see this a lot right and it's usually pretty low stakes but it can be very high stakes too so um this could be any missing security controls so security headers like security features of the web server security features of the host um, the web server is running on or like the container service in which the um, web server is running <laughs> or just like allowing, like, so if you have like a web application firewall and you just like allow direct connections to the origin server still, like that um, is like, it's just a security misconfiguration, right? Um, anytime those things are being bypassed because you didn't set like a strict enforcement of a rule. Um, so, the cloud services thing. So S3 buckets. Um, this is a very common one. So companies will have all their data in an S3 bucket in AWS, which is Amazon Web Services, and then they'll just have it wide open to the internet. And you can just go in and read like all their data. And this happens like all the time. And Amazon even tries to yell at you about it, but people just uh, it just still happens. Um, so then having unnecessary features, right? So this is anything that you don't need to run your application um, using default accounts and credentials. So if your website is based off of something else or your application is based off of something else or um, like some just like predefined stack of services or some like whatever, like CMS or I don't know. If you if your stuff's based on top of something like that and it comes with default credentials, um, you're gonna want to change those. And then using just software that's um, out of date or vulnerable, and we'll talk more about that later. And um, the other the using components with known vulnerabilities. All right. Um, so misconfiguration prevention, right? We want to have a repeatable automated hardening process. So we want to implement, we want to integrate this into our continuous integration and continuous deployment, right? We don't want to have to have a person configure this all one time. We want to define our configuration as code. We want to define it and then have that implemented by 
of the deployment process. So it's hands off. We get a secure implementation one time. We have it in our dev testing for all prod environments. It should be, be configured identically in all those environments and it should be automated um, to prevent like people messing up later. All right, I am gonna speed up because I am running out of time, I think. So um, minimal platform, right? Un no unnecessary features, no unnecessary components. Uh, you know, remove anything that you don't need. Uh, patch management, OSS management, right? Keep your systems updated. Um, you know, use the most current versions of software, keep libraries and frameworks updated. OSS stands for open source software. So a lot of the um, frameworks and libraries and stuff that people use are open source. And a lot of times that stuff's called like OSS vulnerabilities. Anyway, um, we want to review configurations and, um, systems regularly, right? We want to do this architecture review. Um, so we want to look into how things are set up and make sure that we are doing it as securely as possible, not just like set it and forget it, right? Um, but since we have it defined as code, uh, hopefully we can go through and just read it pretty quickly versus like logging into a bunch of systems and seeing how they're configured and stuff like that. Um, so then in sending security directives to clients, so uh, sending the different security headers, so saying strict transport security, so they have to use HTTPS or uh, the cache policy or um, like the anti-click jacking stuff, like X frame options and like all these things we wanna send as much to the browser to tell it how to behave as possible. All right, cross-site scripting. So this is a client-side attack. Uh, it allows an attacker to execute arbitrary uh, JavaScript in a victim's browser. Um, so it can lead to like stealing the user's information, anything from their session. Uh, like a big one a few years ago was like mining cryptocurrency with their CPU. Uh, and it can even escalate to like remote code execution if they're running like an old unpatched browser. So that means they can jump to your operating system and now like install malware like on your host computer, you know? So um, there are three different types. Um, they all come from putting unescaped user input into HTML rendered by the browser, but uh, stored cross-site scripting, it's sent to the server, the server then writes that somewhere, um, and then it's returned to any time a user visits a specific page usually. Uh, and this is the most persistent, it's the most dangerous. If it's found, it's usually like a critical uh, vulnerability. Um, reflected XSS, it's um, basically, when something from like the URL, usually uh, it's like a get parameter or something that you've typed into the URL is then reflected into the page. So it goes to the server, it's processed by the server, and then it's written into the uh, response by the page. Um, and this it usually requires making a user visit some page. So it's like you send them a link and then that link um, has like a cross site scripting payload in the URL, which then uh, loads in their browser. Um, so, yes, um, and then we have uh, DOM-based XSS. So this is, <clears throat> so what, what the difference between this and reflected mostly is, is that uh, it never goes to the server. So you could have any, any time, because a lot of applications, right, they have JavaScript APIs that are um, reading user data from the URL or from some other source and then just writing that into the DOM. So the difference between DOM-based and reflected, the best way to describe it is that DOM-based never goes to the server and it's all a client-side attack. Um, so yeah, it just depends on how uh, that application is getting untrusted user data into it. Um, all right, so here's an example of a reflected trusted scripting attack. So here we have PHP and it's echoing uh, this name within this uh, body out to the page. Um, so if we send a request like this, we'll just say, hello, Chris, which renders, hello, Chris. Um, let's see, we aren't escaping this. We aren't uh, doing anything like anything that's written here is getting sent uh, into the page. So then if we send uh, something like this, right? Um, it will just write this directly. Well, first it will URL decode it. So then convert it back into looking like this. And it will just write this into um, the page, which will uh, um, execute the alert function and make a pop-up appear. Um, 
so it'll render this into the um, into the browser, and then the browser will execute this script. And usually, you aren't just going to try to make a pop up appear, right? Like there are all those other um, there are all the attacks that I described that um, can happen from this. So, um, how to prevent it? Right, using safe frameworks. Um, so Ruby on Rails and React JS both have built-in protections. Um, you want to escape and filter user data passed from HTTP request to the server, right? And we also want to escape user supplied data client side to prevent DOM-based cross-site scripting. And then the last thing on here is a content security policy. So that's a security header which specifies the domains that the browser should uh, load JavaScript from. So um, it will then only execute skip, uh, scripts that are loaded in from source files um, on like the allow list of domains and it will ignore all other scripts and even inline scripts. So this will help you uh, prevent cross-site scripting because if inline scripts are prevented and it's only loading scripts from your servers, even if they do find an XSS vulnerability, right, they won't be able to um, they won't be able to actually exploit it because uh, the browser will refuse to um, will re refuse to execute that JavaScript because it's coming from a place that isn't whitelisted. Um, so then, insecure deserialization. So deserialization is uh, um, when an object is converted into code, which then can be ex. Uh, so deserialization. So serialization is when a code object is converted into data, and then deserialization is when that data is turn it back into a code object. So then uh, an insecure deserialization object is converted into code, which can be executed then by whatever the interpreter or um, whatever. So by the PHP interpreter, or the Python interpreter, or uh, the Java virtual machine or whatever. Uh, anyway, so yeah, these are, these are like the uh, vulnerable things within um, all of these, uh, programming languages. So yes, uh, let's go to the next one. Sorry, I'm trying to go fast because I know we're low on time. Uh, insecurity serialization prevention. So we want to use safe serialization formats wherever possible. We don't want to use like pick, we like, if possible, right? We want to use JSON. Like that's like a very good one or YAML or like any, um, any safe serialization format. Cause you cannot uh, end up like executing code when you're just like, sending an object as json or it, unless you like you would have to have written something like insecure versus um a lot of these right it, it's just built in if you like unpickle something and like there's a class in there that like executes code upon instantiation or whatever right like that's gonna happen um so we want to uh, do integrity checks on um Serialize, serialized data because very rarely is serialization going to be coming from a client to um, a, to the server. Like usually this is going to be like interprocess or like remote process uh, communication. So like it's very rare that you would ever like serialize something pipe because you aren't executing Python in your browser. You know, like so this is usually probably be between two different Python things. So usually how this happens is some sort of data tampering. Um, and we want to perform integrity checks on those objects. Yeah. And then type constraints. So enforcing strict type constraints um, on deserialization before we um, before we actually create the object in code. So um, we should have it um, only like accept like a specific specifically divine, defined set of uh, classes. Uh, and then there's some like language specific fixes, which I will not get into. All right, using components with known vulnerabilities, um, CVEs. So um, yeah, the CVEs are a list of uh, disclosed computer security flaws. Um, so these are specific, um, these are specific instances, right? Of maybe some of these other vulnerabilities that we've talked about, but it's one that has a name. So there's also what's called a CWE, which is a common weakness enumeration. And that's just like a type of weakness. So a CWE would be like cross-site scripting or technically improper neutralization of input during web page generation, cross-site scripting. And then a CVE could be uh, a specific instance of cross-site scripting. So CVE 
11, 8, 39 is like cross-site scripting and some micro-focus arc site logger product affecting all versions from 6.61 to version 7.01, you know. So CVEs are specific instances known. It knows where that code is, and it's like in some product that people are using or in some like open source libraries. So, um, and these are these are all public on the internet, right? And so you don't want to be using components that have known vulnerabilities in them. So uh, first things first, we want to know, uh, like a lack of visibility contributes to this. So not knowing the components that we have, um, using out of date software um, from the OS, web application server, database management system, applications, APIs, any, like anything that's out of date, uh, and then not scanning for, for vulnerabilities. Um, uh, yes. So. How do we prevent this, right? We want to uh, reduce dependency overhead wherever possible. We want to get, we don't want to have too many dependencies. Uh, we want to be able to inventory it and uh, know everything that we have. We want to use vulnerability scanners to scan both like hosts for vulnerabilities. So the servers and stuff that our things are running on, as well as all our dependencies. Like we want to be scanning them for known vulnerabilities. Like, so just like looking at the library version and seeing if it matches up to like a vulnerable version of the library. Um, and then keeping software updated, right? Just like stay ahead of the problem. You don't have to wait for a CVE to be found in whatever like 10 year old like jQuery version that you're using or something like before you just like update it, and just stay the most up to date. Um, and then the last one is insufficient logging and monitoring. So in 2016, the average time of detection to a breach was 191 days. So uh, this is like at most major incidents, right? They go on undetected for a long time. Um, so if we aren't logging auditable events, so like logins, failed logins, high value transactions, um, if like warnings and errors are not um, generating adequate logging, um, and if logs of applications are stored locally um, or are not monitored, right? Um, so if it's just stored only on that web server and you have to like log in to read like the server logs or something like, you're that's not sufficient. Um, and then. <clears throat> well, how do we prevent this, right? We want to log all important events. So application layer in our application that we're writing when it stuff happens that we think is important, we should be writing that to a log somewhere. And then we want to have people looking at those logs. And also we want to have our logs centralized so it's easier to look at those logs. So uh, we're going to use some centralized like log management solution. So one's called Elk. That's like a very common uh, like log management solution now. Um, so it's Elasticsearch, Logstash, and like Kibana. So it's a search tool, like a log ingestion tool, and like this visualization tool, uh, which are stacked together to create this really nice platform. Um, or then a sim, which uh, if you can dump your logs into a sim, like that's cool. Because um, this also has like a sim will have like alerting and um, like, uh, correlation and like a bunch of other like security specific tooling integrated with it. So, um, yeah, and it's important to have it all there. So it's like very easy to see and it, you can correlate disparate logs and stuff because if you like you have your, if you have to log in over here to see these logs and log in over here to see these logs, it's hard to see, right? Um, maybe the correlation between them. All right. So sorry, I went kind of fast at the end. I'll send you my slides if you want. Uh, thank you. Learn more, uh, check out OWASP.org and come to the local OWASP uh, meeting. And that's all I have. Awesome. Great. Thank you, Chris. That was incredible. The, so in depth and so much information to comprehend. Um, I hope everybody was able to follow along. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, this is going to be, or this was recorded, folks. So you will be able to access this presentation on our YouTube channel and on our website. Um, we also always promote our social media. Um, if you're interested in following us, we are CyberUp on LinkedIn and we're, we are we Cyber Up on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Um, and uh, last thing to make note of, uh, we have our second season of the Power Up Cyber Games, which is a youth uh, CTF competition series, Chris mentioned CTFs earlier. Um, so we have one built out for middle school and high school students. It's going to start in the fall. So if you're interested in that, just head to our website, look under youth, and you can find lots of information. Um, so we have just about a minute left. Wow, that was like perfect timing. 
Um, so everybody, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate your presence and your attention. I'm sorry we didn't have any time for questions, but feel free to email the info um, email address or the contact us on our website if you have specific questions for Chris that you would like for him to uh, help you with. Um, I'm sure that he could do that via email very easily. Um, all right, so uh, everyone have a blessed day. Have a wonderful day. Um, thanks again, Chris. You're awesome. Um, I'm looking forward to our next uh, uh, webinar in a few weeks. So um, everybody keep an eye out for that. It's on Eventbrite. Um, and we're going to be talking about software development life cycle. Right? Yes, yes. Yep. So um, that will be the next one. Um, and uh, again, thank you for joining us. And everyone have a wonderful day. Thank you, Mike. Thank you.